of interviews with distinguished Scottish women artists called Scottish Women Can Paint came about as a repost to the statement by the German artist George Baselitz who said, women can't paint, when asked why women were so underrepresented in major museums and exhibitions. This series of interviews with prominent Scottish women artists sets out to disprove that belief and try to understand how against incredible odds a group of dedicated Scottish women artists have managed to create some of the best paintings produced in Scotland and abroad during the last half of the 20th century. This afternoon I'm talking to my old friend Fiona Carlyle who I'm shocked to say I have known for almost half a century since we met at Edinburgh Art College in 1972. Um, and we're both the same age, 67. Uh, and before I begin on the, the more general questions, can I just ask you one uh, more light-hearted question, Fiona? If you, a feisty redhead, were to have heard George Bazalet say that women couldn't paint within your shot of you, what would you have said back to him? I think I would have been so amazed I might not have been able to think of anything too quickly. I mean, I just can't believe anyone could be that stupid. Yes, well, in some ways, he was looking for a, a bit of a scandal because he'd said the same thing years before about East German artists. He said East German artists can't paint, uh, and that got him a lot of press publicity. Didn't Brian Sewell say something similar Oh, did about he, women I think, artists? I think yeah. he did. Um, Let's get on to the simple and more serious questions, just for, for the record. Where and when were you born? Ah, I was born in Wick, in Caithness, 9th of July 1954. Um, was there any interest in art in your family? Uh, my father's brother, Gilbert, was an artist. Uh, he was involved in fabrics, but um, he painted a lot. So he was always a big hero, and I, whenever time, any time we went through to Loch Winnock where he lived, um, I was always given lots of paints and brushes, and oh, so that's interesting. And what about at school? Was were you encouraged at school? I know that Barbara Ray later on was one of your teachers. Um, I yeah, I would say from the time I took art as a full time subject was that second or third year. Mm -hmm. Barbara Ray was a brilliant teacher mm -hmm. and Colin Bryce and the head of department, Ronald MacArthur. In fact, I would say that the school art department, was run, we were very free and then it, after a couple of years and they knew I was doing my hires, they would just say, well, what are you going to do? And I would say, well, I'm not sure. And they said, well, go and talk, talk to Colin, go and talk to whoever the teacher was mm -hmm. and just, you know, get on with it. So when I came to art college, actually, I found art college less liberating than school. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, when did you know you were going to go to art college? Um, did I think, you always know? I think I always wanted to be a painter. There was a time that I was quite interested in music and played the bassoon, but mm. um, painting, I was always going to be a painter. Mm. I mean, Although my mother only told me some years ago that she thought I should have been a lawyer. Look what a... <laughs> 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 Might have been quite a good lawyer. <laughs> well... Um, your mother is a, a, an interesting point and I, in some point I would have quite liked to have had a chance of interviewing her at a hundred years old now. hundred and a half. And, and she has seen your career all the way through. What does she think of your choice now? Um, she probably still thinks I should have been a lawyer. <laughs> but uh, she does, uh, she's very Highland Caithness so mm -hmm. you know there's not much mm -hmm. praise. Mm -hmm. She loved the thistles actually. She has some <laughs> Yeah, she's a tough lady. Yes, I mean, she certainly I've is. known her for 50 years <laughs> as well. Um, Marina Abramovich said, You cannot become an artist. You are either born an artist or not. So, do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I probably think that's true. That you, I mean, it's like I would love to be able to sing, but I can't sing. Mm -hmm. I can sing in Greek, but. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's probably true. I think some people can force it, but it shows. Um, we talked about art college, and that was really going to be my next question. What was your experience of art college? I mean, first of all, do you think as a woman you were treated differently from male students? 
Yes, I would say so, because my art college, as you remember, is quite a macho place. Mm. And I remember in first or second year being told that I painted so well, it was almost like a man's yeah. work. <laughs> and that was supposed to be a compliment. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you got that compliment? Do you think you were held back by the tutors in a sense that they preferred to give things to uh, scholarship and so on to male painters? Um, I didn't find that because I got post-grad and I was mm. in exhibitions. I don't think the tutors really had such an influence as all our fellow students mm. together. Because yes, remember, we were always drawing and painting at night and going to evening classes. I mean, we just didn't yeah, stop. Yeah, and going to each other's flats, flats and you were exactly. painting my portrait. Yes. And we were, I was doing your portrait. We were all yes, I would say together. I would say it was, it was our, our fellow students that had mm. more of an influence. Mm -hmm. Because, the, I mean, I, I remember being told things like Eugene Carolyn had said to me, why are you using that small brush? And I said, well, I'm finishing. Oh, you can't finish, not with a small brush anyway. As Picasso says, it can only be abandoned, not finished. I mean, they would come out with things like that or other tutors saying it was a psychological pose and I would just mm -hmm. sharpen the pencil till they went away mm -hmm. again. Well, I, I can't remember if you had Elizabeth Blackadder as yes. your drawing teacher as well. I had her for three years. Uh, I, the only thing I remember her saying to me was, is that an HB pencil you're using, Andrew? To which I said yes, and she gave no reply. So to this day, I still don't know whether it was right <laughs> or wrong. So, I mean, that, I think that is true. We taught ourselves Else. in many ways, and June Redfern has said something very similar. Um, I've just mentioned Blackadder, and you've mentioned Barbara in the past. Were there any, after thinking at the college, at the sexism, were there any inspirational female tutors? Um. Oh, what was she called? Thora, Cl Thora Klein. Klein. Yes, Actually, when I started doing head, head life and got, I couldn't believe the magic of managing to get a likeness and doing these portraits. And she, at that time, was married to Robin Philipson mm. and used to get him to come up and see my drawings. And she was very quietly um, encouraging. Mm -hmm. Alan Alexander was fun. Oh yes, he was marvellous actually, utterly camp and, and the one who brought a ray of light yes. into it. Yes, because most of the time it, they weren't really, I think they were bored. Yeah. Well, and I think they went to the pub halfway through the morning <laughs> and came was, back. A lot halfway. of us did that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the tutors did as well. <laughs> uh, um, what about Robert you just, Philipson was was inspiring, I would say. Yeah, you just mentioned Phillips, and I do remember you telling me at the time when you were students, Robin Philipson had said, "What about the perspective?" And you had said, "I don't think I need perspective." I didn't like perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and he accepted that. Yes, he did. He he. I, I wasn't always sure what he was saying, but at the end of it, I felt roused up to paint and get on with mm -hmm. it. Whereas the rest of them, you just mm -hmm. lost the will to live. And well, it was interesting that none of us were invited back to become tutors. Well, that is true. And again, again, very few women are ever invited back to become tutors. I think um, there were only two or three women out of a staff of more than a dozen, almost 20, I well, think. Well, what with Vicky Crow, um, Thora Klein, Elizabeth Blackadder. Elizabeth Blackadder. Sam Ainsley was, of course, head of tapestry. Not oh, painting. well, not when I was there. Uh, well, she, was. she was a she, student. Ah, uh, well, she then. She says she only got the job, the interview, because they didn't realise she was a woman. <laughs> <laughs> they were very surprised when she came to the interview. Um, but let, let's leave art school behind us as we rapidly did, because, uh, because we were already, when we were still at art school, beginning to exhibit outside it yes. at the Salt House and so on. So I was going to ask, so how did you forge your career, an independent career outside art school? Well, I remember in my post-grad year that they had asked me what I was planning to do. And I thought that was a really strange question. And I said, well, I'm planning to paint. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, maybe you should go to the Royal College. And I said, well, I've done five years now. I, you know, I think it's, it's about like driving a car. I thought it was time to just go and paint. And I remember saying to them, well, I've got absolutely nothing, so I have nothing to lose. So if I need to do something else down the line, mm -hmm. I can do that. But I'll, I'll paint. Mm -hmm. And that seemed to cause quite a lot of consternation. 
Yes, because of course they hadn't done that. Exactly, I think there were some of them were jealous of, of that. Well, it's interesting because that's a word that you use in uh, they use in Greece a lot, but it's not a word used in this country or in our culture. Mm -hmm. Though I think somebody like Robin Phillipson wasn't jealous. We he quite liked rebels, mm -hmm. don't you think? And he did actually support the gallery a little bit by giving a picture into an auction. Elizabeth Back had a lended thing, so I think the most distinguished of them who 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 were successful in John fact, Houston was very was always very kind uh, yeah I mean I think those he gave were, me uh, my first pink paint because mm -hmm. they got it cheap in the art college <laughs> shop <laughs> <laughs> well you certainly use that and we're going to talk about uh, uh, technical matters and your practice later but I'm still thinking about career so exhibitions you exhibited actually with me at the yes, Salt House Society. Yes, in the Salt House Society. Were we still students then? Yes, oh, so and we were supposed to have gotten the permission of the college to exhibit. To exhibit. Yeah. And do I remember, didn't the head, one of the big directors of the college... Head of design bought one of my paintings. Paintings, yes. So you already started when you were still a student. Yes. Uh, and he, uh, a very serious purchaser. Uh, then I suppose after that, would be the 369 gallery. Well, I think we were all thinking that we were going to continue painting and therefore continue exhibiting. Now, the only real gallery at the time, I think, was the Scottish Gallery, mm. and you could only really have an exhibition there if you got a job at the Art College, which we yes. plainly <laughs> were not going mm -hmm. to be uh, uh, invited to do. Okay. So, yes, basically the idea so was... So it was a, your idea of, well, let's start our own gallery. gallery with... Uh, Andrew showing young Scottish artists, which we were. And I think we still are at 16. <laughs> six, <laughs> well, six, I thought six, I was seven. until I got my hip. <laughs> <laughs> um, but apart from exhibiting at 369 Gallery, what about um, critical success? How do you think you've received the critical success you were due? Um, and has it changed over the years? I think I've never been fashionable or trendy, so mm. that's perhaps got in the way. Mm -hmm. And being told by friends that uh, painting is dead, so we should stop painting. In fact, Lizanne said that. She said, I've told June to stop. And I said, oh really, what did June do? <laughs> and I said, and then I told her that some Swiss dealer mm. had bought paintings of mine and she looked so surprised and she said, oh, Eric Frank bought your paintings, and I said yes. So I said, oh, shall I hang on a couple of months before I stop? <laughs> yes, and she, that was Lizanne McGregor, who's working for the Arts Council then. Yes. It was a friend, but yes. Decided, and bought paintings. Uh, decidedly trendy, however, she followed the fashions. Um, yes, but you had paintings bought by the, National, the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art. Not for some years, not, not yeah. you know, it took a while, but I mean, why, why would they buy it immediately and anyway? Also, you have finally paintings and uh, portraits in the Scottish National Portrait Gallery. And the House of Commons. Uh, House of Commons, too. So, so <laughs> this is a slightly more difficult question I was going to come on to. Do you think that you've been forced to become more of a portraitist because of having to, to finance yourself as an artist? Um, sometimes, but I don't think so because the, the big Total project came by a complete fluke. I would, mm. Do you want me to talk about that? Oh, yes. Do um, talk about that. I was asked by a friend of mine to become patron of Spinal Injuries Scotland. And uh, we went up for this dinner called the Oil and Gas Quiz. And I was sat beside Sir Ian Wood on one side and Andrew Hogg from Total. And Andrew Hogg was very interested in painting. And I said I'd always been interested in going offshore. So after months, I was invited to go offshore, which was a dream. And... From that, the portrait gallery, Julie Lawson in the portrait gallery, saw a couple of the paintings that I did. And um, the idea of having this big exhibition about the oil workers mm. was, was spawned mm. almost overnight. Mm. And yes, looking back now, it, it would never happen now. Yeah, and that's really, in a sense, not like individual portrait. It was a project. Yes, to and also I did um, some of the huge, big self-portraits I painted in Crete mm. of me offshore. Mm -hmm to supplement them. So yeah. it wasn't just portraiture okay. in that yeah. sense. Uh, and and that, that was an exploration of, of my own, of, uh, of you know, yeah. going off in helicopters yeah. to oil platforms. So in that sense, I mean, career happens often by chance yes. connections. And I think June would say the same. Yes, and luck. Yes. 
But oh, another imp hugely important part of your work is the fact that you move not permanently but backwards and forward to Greece from very early on. Mm -hmm. When did you, I know we went to Greece on holiday together to Hanya which is when you fell in love with it. I can't remember what year. Were we you, still you students? And, you and Andrew had gone down to Crete to see Craxton. Johnny Craxton. And yeah. Alp and I had gone up to I think the north and Skopelos, we've been to Peloponnese. And you, we met in Athens, and mm. you were raving and raving and raving about it. And mm. I hadn't met Craxton in mm. Edinburgh because mm. I was working in that awful bar. Mm. Was it the clamshell or? I thought it was, was it a three. T I thought it was the a three, three tons. tons of the clamshell, one of these yeah. ghastly places. Yes. And it was my night off, so I missed him. Mm -hmm. And it was his stories of Greece in the mm. early years that just made me think yeah. about yeah. going there and, and going to China. In fact, that was what made me think. Yeah. And perhaps we should ex explain that Johnny Craxton was a great neo-romantic painter alongside Minton and that whole group. Mm -hmm. um, who Uncle Hoon and McBride, and McBride we talked about. Absolutely. And, uh, and of course, he's the person who taught uh, Lucy and Freud to draw. And he regretted it. Not well it. enough. Not well enough. <laughs> he regretted it hugely afterwards. He said to me, I wish I'd never taught him. I preferred his work before he became like an art school academic. But so it, it, it brought you in contact, not just with an international thing in there, but w w with the history of British painting, really. I mean, I think that's something that, that's very important because you were then connected into a rich tradition. Mm -hmm. And I mean, did you ever have any painting lessons from Cracks and all? No, but he would often come round and he was very keen on the portraits and he. I remember he said to me and uh, Andrew McIntosh Patrick mm. in the Fine Arts Society that the reason I'm a good portrait painter is that I'm not a portrait painter, <laughs> I'm a painter. Okay. And I've always stuck to that because I've always yeah. thought portraits have to be paintings yeah. in their own right. That's a very good point, actually. I, I never heard it say that. The thing I always remember him, he came to visit me when, in art school when we were still at art school because he was working in Edinburgh on a tapestry for, that's the, right, in for, Stirling. The, for the Dovecot tapestry. That was for Stirling University, yeah. that's right. And he came in when the tutors weren't bothering to teach us, as he said, and cracks and bothered to come in and look at the paintings. I always remember him saying to me, he said, you have to be careful to ground your figures. You don't want them falling out the bottom of the painting. <laughs> and I've always <laughs> remembered that. Be careful of the bottom of the painting. Well, he also, I mean, I firmly believe, again, old fashioned, that drawing is the essence of everything and mm -hmm. drawing is looking. So if you can't, if you can't draw, mm -hmm. what, what is the point if you can't, mm -hmm. if you can't do that? And he was absolutely, his, he could draw like an angel. Absolutely. I mean, he became rather, old, he was seen as being rather old fashioned, but I know a big rediscovery of him, actually. Mm -hmm. Can I also then talk to you about, you You were more in Crete, more in Greece, really, than you were in Scotland, wouldn't you say? Um, well, after going to Crete, I then got uh, an Arts Council big award. Mm -hmm. And I thought, having spoken to Craxton, I would mm -hmm. love to go somewhere before it became too touristy. Mm -hmm. And that was the dream of going to China. Mm -hmm. But then my marriage finished halfway down the Yangtze River. <laughs> <laughs> but and then I think I got the wanderlust. And then friends from art college, Lillian Wilmer, mm -hmm. went off to Crete because mm -hmm. we'd been raving about mm -hmm. it. And then I went mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. to see them. Mm -hmm. And the plan was that we would um, mm -hmm. be in a studio mm -hmm. together and be as mm -hmm. we were at art college. Mm -hmm. But that didn't work out. Yes, well, so she, I toughed it out for many years. <laughs> yeah. um, but do you think you needed to get out of Scotland in a way to find yourself artistically? Um, I think it helped. I, well, I think it gave me another life. I mean, the first time mm. I went to Italy when I was at college and I just couldn't believe that the sea could be warm and that you could sit outside in a trattoria without a cardigan. And I just mm. thought I've been born in the wrong place. <laughs> And so I think Greece for me was a, a whole liberation mm -hmm. from childhood, from upbringing, from some of the, the not so wonderful aspects about mm -hmm. the Scottish sardine tin culture. And it did make your paintings flower and sprout, really, didn't it? I mean, those, I remember those big Erastes series, one of which, um, did the National Gallery buy one of those? Uh, oh, no, they no bought two Glasgow, Glasgow, oh, Glasgow Museums bought one. bought one. And we showed those in Moscow. They're the yes. ones shown. 
they were marvelous. And of course, it worked in Moscow because they understood that the you know the orthodox the orthodox um, what do you call it the orthodox mm. axis. So there's a huge mm. um, understanding Standing or sympathy between Greek Russia. And culture, and yes, and yes. those were marvelous paintings. Um, you don't work on such a big scale anymore, is that? I don't have the same studio and I couldn't get the same paper. I did do some big canvases. Um, yeah, I, I still hanker after doing some of those big ones, but mm. sometimes, well, as Mark Twain said, sometimes it takes longer to write a short story than... Yes, no, no, than, I'm not. Uh, I, I, you were talking about the Chinese pictures, which were, well, that was a marvellous series. The, the Chinese opera, which I think we sold in Chicago, showed at the Chicago Art Fair. I still have a small um, sketch you did of the Chinese jugglers on their back and the, with the pink tights or something. So, and that's beautiful. I love it. And so uh, you're I think Keith Hartley bought that one of them juggling the rugs. Yes, I think he did. The, the big one. Uh, uh, we haven't mentioned that we mentioned Greece, which is a crucial part of your life. Um, and we haven't also mentioned the fact that you exhibited in America a lot as well through the Chicago Art Fair, uh, where your work was really appreciated, wasn't it? And then with the fire, we lost a lot of the contact lists of the people that bought a lot of our work. Yes, a lot of your best paintings are in America. Mm -hmm. They sold them out. Do you think, and I think this is, is it a question of poverty in Scotland, a, a, a poverty about buying art, or is it simply that the Scots were too canny to, to spend, you know, 10,000, well, an American would think nothing of $10,000, a, a doctor or a professional. For a, for a person in Edinburgh, a doctor, to spend a thousand pounds, they would think was very extravagant. Yes, and prob probably they didn't think we had the form and the credibility of being in the right galleries and being mm -hmm. part of the RSA and the whole establishment, mm -hmm. whereas America wasn't interested in that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's interesting now, of course, that the RSA has changed. One of the other interviewees, of course, is Joyce Cairns, who uh, is now the first woman president of the RSA. But really, her first major exhibition was with the 369, she always says. She had one in Aberdeen, and then her other big one was the 369, which set her off on her way. And, and she talks about that in, in her interview. Well, 369 was just incredible in those days. And it was it was fun and all sorts. It was a draw for mm -hmm. all sorts mm -hmm. of people. And yeah. they appreciated it. But I think maybe it had to come to an end in a sense that it had done as much as well, it Well, I always thought if, if it had been supported properly by the arts councils mm -hmm. and whatever, instead of this drip mm -hmm. feed way that they used on mm -hmm. DeMarco and harnessed mm -hmm. it properly and harnessed your energy properly, you know, things wouldn't have been yeah. so difficult. Yes. And I, I mean, you know, for the sake of 10p here yeah. or there. Yes. And, I, and we can be honest about this. Basically, they blackmailed the board of the 369 gallery to try and hand it over to be used by the arts council and the city council itself. Um, which strangled us uh, financially, many ways. Well, they but, remember they didn't want us to even go to Chicago because they yeah. thought that we were going to embarrass Scotland. Yes, I remember that it was we, and we didn't get a grant for going to Chicago. We did it. We did it ourselves. We raised the funding. Um, but forgetting the past for a minute, going to the present. COVID, of course, has stopped you going back to Greece. But what are your plans? Are your plans to to continue? despite the high temperatures, <laughs> are they to <laughs> continue painting in Greece? Oh, definitely. I, I think um, it got to a stage that, although I was always ready to come back here and, and do any work or any commission, everybody had the idea that I was in Cyprus, for one thing, not even in Crete, <laughs> and therefore too far away. So I decided after a while that it was just too hard and to switch headquarters back to Britain and then go back to Greece for the bits that I liked, for the friends that I liked, but to have um, the company and the life in Scotland again. Mm. So what I often do, like this painting, I well, when I used to be able to do that, I will start a lot of paintings off in Greece and work very hard there and then bring them back mm. in the old drain pipes yes. and finish them here. What, drain pipe and ski bags? Oh, you don't use the Just the bag. old drain pipes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just put them in a ski bag. I remember once at Athens airport, this man saw me and he said, oh, in Greek, he said, oh, but my dear, you know, you really don't need to bring the drain pipe to Chicago. I live there. They have them there. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, if you remember, I say this 
carefully on film that there were lots of customs problems of getting paintings into, into America because you had to pay money down uh, in case you sold them. And we would roll them up and put them in a giant ski bag. And I do remember in Boston in May, as we went through customs saying, is there much skiing <laughs> in Boston? I said, no, no, we are going to Taos and Santa Fe where there's snow all year round and we got through. Um, can we talk a bit about your, your practice in painting then? Do you do sketches first or do you just begin almost on plein air on a, a thing? Um, I often do lots of well, like behind me, lots of mm. little tiny sketches, almost, mm. and I use a sketch pad still a lot. Mm. But in China, I learned that there I couldn't sketch because there would be about 30 people mm. all around me. Mm. So I learned to hold it in my memory mm. and then go back and in the evening start drawing out these mm. memory sketches. So I still use that. But sometimes if I'm feeling really courageous, I'll get a big sheet of paper and a bit of black paint and just start immediately on the large one because sometimes mm -hmm. the small one works out better than mm -hmm. the large one and trying to build it up onto mm -hmm. a bigger canvas, it has lost the spontaneity. Okay. But, so if I'm feeling really like one like mm -hmm. this, I'll start that straight away. But what you're saying also, black paint, so then it does begin with a drawing even if it's yes. a big painting. Yes, yes. Begins and with it's a got drawing to feel always. right. And if it doesn't mm -hmm. feel right, then I tear it up or mm -hmm. turn it over mm -hmm. or start mm -hmm. again if it hasn't got that click yeah. and the magic. Mm -hmm. You are described as well as a portraitist, a colorist. I mean, that's, I suppose, in the, in the colorist tradition. Or do you think that your color really came from, it's a Mediterranean palette, a real one rather um, than inherited? I, I'm not sure. I think I, think I had a, quite a colorful palette anyway. Mm -hmm. And I've never really thought of myself as a colorist, just more expressionistic in mm. a sense. And in fact, when I first went to Greece, I was so worried about the colors getting brighter and bleached. I realized that um, I was painting with the shutters closed. <laughs> um, so they got quite dark, if you mm. remember, in the beginning. Yes, that lovely big one you did of Hania was, was quite dark and very beautiful. Um, very cubist, I remember that one. Well, I do think of my paintings in a way as quite abstract, as mm -hmm. they work in an abstract way as mm -hmm. well. And if it's a still life, it can't just be, you know, a vase of flowers. It's mm -hmm. got to trans, mm -hmm. um, what's the word, trans, uh, transform into mm -hmm. poetry. It's got to become mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. else. It can't just be a person sitting in front of me. Mm -hmm. The magic has, I always mm -hmm. call it magic. The magic has to happen to make it mm -hmm. into a painting. Mm -hmm. It can't just be like a photograph, otherwise what's the point? We're going to also ask young people about how art affects your domestic life. To a certain extent, has this peripatetic travel, gypsy sounds like, has that affected your private life in a way? Yeah, I would, I would say so. I mean, paintings always come first. Yes, well, I was going to, there is a question I've asked the others, which is, um, doesn't apply to you so much uh, or to Joyce, but it, but um, Maggie Hambling once said, if, uh, and think of this theoretically, if she had a painting crying in one room and a baby crying in the other room, she would have to go to the baby. Well, I suppose, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> for its human right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but uh, on a more serious note then, um, we've been talking about with the others over the kind of feminist artists. You know, although two thirds of art students um, coming out of art college uh, graduates are women, less than a quarter of the main exhibiting artists are women. Now, this is better than it was um, in the 80s, 70s, and 80s when we started, but it's still um, it's still hardly equal. Um, do you feel being a woman has, in your career, um, been a disadvantage to you? Um, I don't know if I can really answer that because I don't know what it might have been like to be a man. I think in Scotland, it's. I think there's always been a strong 
number of female artists, and we, you mm. know, Anne Redpath. I mean, mm. there's, there have always been. And Airdly, of And course. Airdly. So I think, uh, and the teachers that I had, like Barbara mm. Ray, mm. were pretty strong women. So mm. I don't know if I felt that, but I think, you know, as, as a woman, of course, you're prejudiced mm. and not taken seriously. Mm. For example, oh, you just draw in colour because you can't draw, mm. you know, in black and white, mm. or as I said earlier, you draw, you paint so well, it's almost like a man's painting. Yeah, but the th I was going to say, the thing is, you actually paint better than men. And I would say this is the thing I've been thinking since doing these interviews, why I chose women artists. And it, it came about because a conversation I had in Santa Fe in the 80s over a bottle of tequila with Judy Chicago, when she brought up that fact that at that point, uh, half of the graduates of art schools in America were women and something like... 8% of exhibitors were women, and only 1% of artists featured in art books were women. Um, and that made me think of what the 369 Gallery, and I went back and I looked at our catalogue of exhibitions, and to my gratification and surprise, I, would, I, I found it was, we'd shown almost a bit more women yes. than men. Yes. And I'm wondering if that, that was not positive discrimination. No. That's it just happened how it happened. Naturally. And I would say, of course, with the support of people like you and Caroline McNairn, who were always there advising me, um, I had a female perspective from you. But also I would think in my own, now I'm thinking about it carefully doing this, these interviews, and this is the last one, so it's really coming to a fore. I would say, I think the woman's art was evidently better. I preferred it to most of the men. I still chose almost half male artists. And I think it's because I could see the struggle that the woman had gone through and had at least partially won and made it more interesting. Do you think that you've gone through a struggle? Oh, I suppose I've, I've you know, chosen a difficult route in life. And I've mm. often thought it's like walking a tightrope without mm. a, without a, a safety net, mm. and I think a lot of male artists um, have the help of the women who they met at art college who stopped yeah. painting to either mm. have children or look after mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. I don't think most male mm. artists could live the lives of the women's art, mm -hmm. the women's lives. Yeah. Yes, well, when Caroline married Hugh Collins, who was then working as a sculptor and a writer. She said, don't think I'm going to make the tea and wash the dishes. Exactly. <laughs> Which is, but um, do, you, do you think that there is a female aesthetic sensibility or is it just a matter of personal experience? I think it's a human, a human thing. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but I mean, I've always felt... I'm a, I never, I've never thought of myself as a female artist. I just think of myself as a, as a painter that but happens to be a woman. I've always thought that. That's what almost everyone <laughs> really? said. And from even old um, filming of Pat Duthwaite, where she said, well, I'm, I'm neither male or female when I paint. I'm just an artist. Yes. And I think it's absolutely true. Oh. Um, so then throughout your career, how have you defines success as an artist? Um, how I've defined it mm -hmm. on the Bank of Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> a friend for life. Um, I think just managing to keep painting and not giving in. And mm -hmm. I've always thought not have, you know, lack of money and lack of courage should not mm -hmm. get in the way mm -hmm. and just keep going. And if I was to think that I had to, you know, 20, 30 years of living on this tightrope, it might put me off, but I try not to think mm -hmm. like that. So then how necessary has discipline been in your career? Huge, hugely necessary. Mm -hmm. Because when I first went to Crete, I realised that nobody in the world cared what time I got up, if I painted, if I didn't paint, it didn't affect anyone's life. But it it affected my my my, my life and my mm. mental well being, mm. so I've I've been pretty disciplined. What other quality do you think is most needed to be a successful artist? Humanity, empathy, mm. drive. I suppose mm. drive mm. against the odds. Yes, stamina. Yes, <laughs> stamina. Um, 
just the kind of general questions I've asked people before, and it's just, I think, of interest to people. And I think you've already mentioned Craxon, but let's say, what, and, um, and Robin Phillipson, what artists influenced you? Influenced me? Oh, all sorts of artists at different times. Matisse. Mm. And then when I've been er early Italian Renaissance, Titian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, German expressionist mm -hmm. artist, I can't mm -hmm. remember right now. Yeah. All outside. <laughs> all, 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 all sorts. Yeah. And Red Path, Gillis. Well, you're going to say, I'm going to say all outside Scottish tradition, but you've mentioned Red Path and Gillis, Gillis. who's, I think, vastly underrated. Mm -hmm. So do I. As a painter. And well, the thing about Gillis, I find most, his watercolors I find most interesting. And that's another question. You paint mostly on acrylic and paper now, don't you? You, you well, used, I used to do oil. Well, I used to paint in oil, and then when I left college, I started on this very little red table, doing just because mm. of the size, doing mm. watercolours. Mm. And I realised then how difficult watercolour is as a medium. And then as the paintings got bigger, I moved into gouache, and mm. then the gouache wasn't enough, and mm. I came round to acrylics mm. that way. But I think I paint in acrylics in the same way as I would have painted in oil. oil and it dries quicker and it's more portable and you can knock it out and start again mm -hmm. if you need to and change mm -hmm. change one one part mm -hmm. um so you, you were talking mainly about the artists that influenced you being outside scotland did you consider the scottish art world too insular i think the um in the the, like the establishment, the coziness of, you know, of the establishment. Yeah. That's, you know, the new, you know, all the new town houses that have okay. to have a certain painting by somebody and a certain mm -hmm. bank that will have mm -hmm. a, a yeah. East Lothian landscape. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. I think that's fairly restricting. I think that maybe has changed, beginning to change nowadays. But um, um, finally, I'm going to ask you if you had to give advice nowadays to a young female artist who is starting up what advice would you give to her i think the, what i what i gave to myself that um, don't let lack of courage or money stop you doing it if that's what you want to do mm -hmm. and don't listen to people because i'm sure lots of people thought i should have stopped painting including my own tutors and <laughs> and our friend lizanne <laughs> and your mother would have referred you to be a, <laughs> be a lawyer. lawyer well thank goodness you're not a lawyer and fiona thank you very much it's a pleasure to have known you for 50 years and i hope their friendship will go on for a good deal longer. well judging by my mother we've got another 50, <laughs> 50 and a half <laughs> thank you very much thank uh, you